So we've just finished up our Halloween series and the Resident Evil episode is now out there. And in the beginning, we're joking. You brought up the movie Copland and we were talking about Sylvester Stallone's, uh, yeah. like the manner of which he speaks. And um, I was watching Red Letter Media's new, uh, was it Wheel the Worst? One of their best of the worst. And at one point, Sylvester Stallone came up and Chelsea knew this and I didn't know this, but, but apparently when he was being born, they, I guess, were using tongs and they crushed his skull. Jesus Christ. And that's as an infant and like as a newborn. And that's why he has kind of a sagging lip. And oh. I guess as to why he speaks that way. Jesus oh, Christ. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> Which, <laughs> Which we we were very openly joking about that for like. Maybe, I mean, a lot of people joke about that. Yeah. Yeah. I still think that line in that movie is hilarious, but I didn't know yeah. that. And Chelsea was like, yeah. For those who don't know, it's like an internet series where they just watch like random VHS tapes. And it was like an exercise video with celebrity parents. And it was Robin Williams' mom. Was it like De Niro's dad? And then. Yeah, I don't know. I didn't watch it yet. It's pretty yeah. good. <laughs> and it was it was Sylvester Stallone's mom. And she's told that story? No, oh. no. <laughs> but she does like look like him, except... Yeah. Except they brought... her skull isn't crushed. <laughs> well, she has a little bit of a lip sag, too, which is... I don't know if they're... that family is a lineage of botched births by doctors with... <laughs> who are, like, too literal See, now you tongs. took the joke and made it way worse. <laughs> <laughs> it's the fundamental question of nature versus nurture. Yeah. yeah. Are we born with lip sags, or do we just happen to... <laughs> No, when she was giving birth to him, she's like, I know how to do this, guys, and then instructed them, and then they... Yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. So, I don't get it. What are we the lesson here? <laughs> oh, don't make fun of people unless you know what kind of object pulled them out of the womb. <laughs> And whether or not it crushed their skull. <laughs> so we still don't have an answer for Christopher Walken, though, who also came up. And I don't know what that birth was like. Whatever. I'll lean on the fact that he's wealthy and I hate wealthy people. Yeah, That's sure. why I can make fun of him. Yeah, he has enough money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he can get rid of his crushed it's, skull shame. It's called punching up. Look it up in the comedy dictionary, people. <laughs> well, then the question is, how much money would it take? How much would you trade <laughs> to, uh, to crush your skull? Well, then... <laughs> Take. We're in the wrong business. We Ten thousand dollars. We're professional skull crushers. You let me crush your skull for ten thousand dollars. I let you crush my skull for free. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's... Yeah. Well, unless it'll it'll change your speaking pattern so much that it becomes synonymous with your personality and identity to the point that actually makes you more yeah. individual and. <laughs> Yeah, I think it also case Rambo. Rambo. just kill it. <laughs> yeah, but then you also got to be in the new Rambo. Oh, no. $20,000. <laughs> <laughs> all right, uh, gentlemen, it's fall of 2005, and all is not right with the world of it's 2019, Warcraft. dude. You're off. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Bodies are littering the streets of Ironforge. Bones are decaying in the alleys of Orgrimmar. Neighboring cities are in an absolute panic. This week, we're going to talk about how a simple programming oversight accidentally created their own in-game version of SARS. <laughs> <laughs> what many users thought was going to be a fun update that would introduce a whole new raid and boss actually ended up becoming an <laughs> epidemical nightmare, the likes of which no MMO had ever seen. How did this happen? I have no idea, but luckily we have someone here who does, Mr. Dan Bittner. Hey, good so, to be here. Yeah, welcome to the podcast, finally. You've got a good, I think, like, radio speaking voice. It's got a nice... Oh, thank as, you. Man. As opposed to the three of us who have annoying voices. This yeah. has been in the works for a while. I'm very glad we delayed it, though, because now I have WoW experience. Because <laughs> I went to Dan because I had none, but now that I've played some classic, I can kind of speak to okay. it. But yeah, he's, he's still, he's still the expert. Yeah. I played back then a little bit. Uh, yeah. But uh, for those at home, this is Hot Button. I am Randall Beatrice, here as always with Austin Blakesley. Yeah, yeah. And Chris Anatuano as well. You. So, how's everybody feeling? Great. Everybody feeling good? good? After excited. last night? Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. And yeah. Not, I don't think the four of us got much sleep probably no, last night. No, not much. Oh, yeah. No, so. I didn't. <laughs> Just so to fill everybody in, huge orgy at Randall's house last night. <laughs> But we're all tired. Yeah, we should have started earlier. Yeah. So I have not played much WoW. I played a little bit in... I guess this was probably around 04 when it first came out, maybe? 05? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. It's a little when bit Burning in high school. Crusade, 2005. That was 2007. Burning Crusade was 2007. It was 2007. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, because I was actually just starting college at that point. I remember the box that I have was the big, not the, the battle war chest. chest. No, no, because I think that came with Burning Crusade. It didn't did. It? Yeah. So no, I, I, I bought. I still have it in my house. It's an old box, and it, there's a giant sticker on it. It's like we just hit one million players. Like. <laughs> which, you know, compared to what they would get to. so. But I don't have the most experience, but I have seen both Outbreak and Contagion, so let's get into it. <laughs> what could have my poor human hunter have done to survive this disaster? <laughs> All right. Oh, human. Alliance. <laughs> I was Alliance. I'm a horde now. Um, are you? I'm all, all in. Are you both horde? Yes. Horde. Mm. Okay, so... Before we get into this whole thing, mm -hmm. I realize we've done now three. This will be our third MMO episode. And for the yeah. layman, we've never actually explained like the mechanics of an MMO. So I'm going to go down a brief history of Warcraft. Then me and Dan are going to go down like a rundown of what an MMO is. Then we'll get into the story. Okay. A lot of people probably don't know how far back Warcraft really does go. Yes. So... World of Warcraft, for those that somehow don't know, is a massively <laughs> multiplayer episode. online no. <laughs> role-playing game developed by the probably the one big company we haven't really covered, Blizzard, Blizzard. Entertainment. Who in the there's uh, nothing to cover. <laughs> they, they they pretty straight and narrow. Usually, yeah, they're right? doing really well right, <laughs> right now. now. Yeah. <laughs> so BlizzCon is a week. By the time now. this comes out, BlizzCon will have happened, yeah. and Overwatch Two and Diablo Four, which <laughs> totally didn't leak when this is being recorded, <laughs> will have been announced. We're gonna seem like we can predict the future. Guys. <laughs> yeah, guys, we're gonna make Overwatch Two. <laughs> I'm a fortune teller. We have not seen. BlizzCon or the aftermath of that. This yeah, is not an episode fun. about what Blizzard is currently going through. <laughs> I'm excited for BlizzCon. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind that we had a, uh, an episode also a month ago about... Called Hong Kong, Kong 97. 97. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> we timed these very well. <laughs> Both topics that have been yeah, on the Another thing, thing that maybe even some people that play World of Warcraft, which I will from this point on refer to as WoW. I'm sorry, what's that stand for? <laughs> World of Warcraft. <laughs> oh. Um... <laughs> is the fourth game in the Warcraft series. Uh, the first three were real-time strategy games, which is... Yeah, Warcraft 5 is coming again. Now it's the <laughs> No, Warcraft 3 Remastered. Dude, oh, yeah, yeah. Which will actually become important, and Dan will get to that in a bit. But those are real-time strategy games, games where you have an overhead view and you build buildings and build up armies and then attack each other. I love RTS. Yeah. yeah. Come see me. That's first... why I, I looked through script and I was like, oh, Warcraft 3, that was my Warcraft. We really but... kind of reached the... <laughs> the the end of kind of, kind of yeah. dying off, really. Pe I mean, people say that MOBAs were what did that. I can yeah. see that. Um... Well, MOBAs sort of became, I guess, an evolution of it, and then nobody looked back, I'd say I guess. Civ and Total War are probably like the oh, last... Oh, that's yeah. true. But they're, they're kind of like true. hybrid. RTSs. They're, like, not they're not like a they're not, they're not really. It's not like Red Alert or Starcraft or anything. I mean, like, I think they're. Are they fundamentally even RTS? I thought the RTS is had you had to be doing it in real that's time. That's true. Like, that you know, you they would be a real time. Yeah, I guess, uh, yeah. Total War is real Total time. War. The oh, is battle, is battle, is not battle is real time. Civ is turn based yeah. strategy. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. It is funny, though, because when Blizzard had that however long year plan for StarCraft II and when Sons of Liberty came out, it was like a huge deal. And then by the time the last expansion came out, the Protoss one, everybody was kind of like, eh, and moved on. <laughs> it was kind of sad. Like, I like StarCraft. It was, yeah. It just doesn't have the same um, power. I can play for free. <laughs> yeah. I think true. StarCraft, another Blizzard RTS. Yeah. That one's in space. Craft is in the past. <laughs> yeah. Hell. For those that don't know. <laughs> uh, I mean, with modern WoW expansions, yeah. they're pretty much in space as well, so. Oh, and I didn't know that. And Diablo's yeah. in hell. So. <laughs> yeah. They got, all, I mean. they got everywhere covered. Africa <laughs> with Overwatch. Hell with Diablo. I think Overwatch China takes... with half of their business. <laughs> <laughs> Overwatch takes place in more places than that. There are three Warcraft games before World of Warcraft. The first being Warcraft Orcs and Humans in November 23rd, 1994. Did not play that. I don't have the dates for the other two, but November 23rd is an important date. Can and you I'll get find to that. those old games? Like Warcraft yeah. 1? Like, can you play that? You can. I don't know if you can it's legally not play it. Or anything, I or... was talking to Dan about this a while ago. It's uh, weird how the, the where, legacy where, is. Like, they're remastering Warcraft 3, and he was like, well, yeah, obviously Warcraft 3 is the most popular mm. one. And I was like, yeah, but there are so many people <laughs> who played that in WoW who have never touched one and two because they're so That's old true. and hard to find. Remaster rock and roll racing, <laughs> Blizzard. Yeah. Um, and then a year later, in December 95, we have Warcraft 2 Tides of Darkness, or Tide of Darkness. I don't remember which one. I think it's Tide. And then in July of 2002... 
Warcraft 3 Reign of Chaos, the popular one. That yeah. was the, the 3D one. But World of Warcraft actually started development around 1999 or 2000. I have varying reports in my notes. Around 1999 or 2000, a couple years before Warcraft 3 came out. It started because this was around the time that EverQuest was really big. EverQuest yeah. came out in 98? Either 98 or 99. I think it might be. When, uh, when did EverQuest 2 come out? I want to say it was probably 99. Okay. So the game was announced before the release of Warcraft 3 in September of 2001. And it had some differences, some very fundamental differences with EQ, which yes. is the shortened version of EverQuest for those that don't know. EQ and WoW? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the areas that I can definitely speak to is a lot of Warcraft's development was really influenced by how it contrasted with EverQuest, because EverQuest was kind of, right. uh, that was the big MMO that was kind of the precursor yeah, to Yeah, I remember WoW. seeing posters and shit at Best Buy, yeah. you know, they have to have the computer setups in there, like, I don't know if any of your Best Buys did, they had like live computers where you could play oh, games yeah. and yeah, shit. Oh yeah, yeah, for a little yeah. while. So Jeff Kaplan of Overwatch fame and yes. of Warcraft <laughs> of was actually, he was actually a guild leader or a big raider during really? EverQuest, and you can actually, <laughs> he's actually great. infamous for complaining about the designs of different raids wow. and different things in EverQuest. Complaining can and get you a job. Ironically, yeah, now it works. <laughs> one himself. So. That's pretty good. Yeah, now he's um, on the other side yeah. where the people are complaining to him all but the time. The thing about that influenced so much of WoW's development is really making decisions that contrasted with what was done in EverQuest because you can really sum up EverQuest as just mm. being a massively punishing game. Like Un not welcoming to new people yeah. or just unforgiving? Or? Unforgiving. Okay. Unforgiving. And I'm definitely going to, when it becomes relevant, bring up the contrasts um, okay. because they really did not think about EverQuest in terms of game balance. They really didn't think about things mm. in that way at the time. It was really about kind of building a world in that sense. Yeah, so I mean, there wasn't a lot of blueprint, I guess, to go off not of. Yeah, really exactly. This is one of the first. So. <laughs> yeah. so WoW was really designed with much more of making it more palatable to So they watch the that and they're like, this yeah. is what we'll, we yeah. won't do and this is what <laughs> Which we Which is won't. funny <laughs> because now That's smart. WoW Classic is considered punishing. That's the interesting part. <laughs> Part, yeah. right? Compared to like new MMOs, you really have a kind of sliding scale. Yes, yeah, that's exactly true because WoW Classic is seen as beneficial compared to modern WoW because it was more difficult, but games like EverQuest were much, much yeah. more punishing than WoW Classic. Yes. I, I found like Guild Wars like way more palatable than Warcraft. Yes, when, for similar like, reasons. Vanilla Warcraft, guns, yeah. right? Guild Wars, I think my... There are I some. Think, yeah. yeah, but the, Guild Wars was uh, was kind of the first big MMO that was more instanced. Yeah. And, I don't know but, when Final Fantasy XI came out. It was ooh, it was similar to, played that to EverQuest in its design. Final Fantasy XI was around about, I want to say, 2003. I think it was think a little before wow because it was it also was... you were right by the way everquest one was 98 everquest two was actually 2004 oh. which was the same year as uh, I think, wow i think yes. i said 99 you were correct oh no no it is 99 oh, i'm 90. sorry oh, okay. yeah it was 99 you were right i think kunark was either 2000 or 2001 and maybe velius was 2001 somewhere along those few years yeah. was the the timeline of classic eq so like I said, for those that don't know, a bit of a rundown on WoW specifically, but mostly MMOs, and this is where the comparisons between WoW and EverQuest are going to come up. So, for those that don't know, MMO stands for Massively Multiplayer Online, and because of the way the world is structured, instead of joining a match with 15 other players, you're joining a server with thousands of other players. And running these servers is not cheap. So, no. players are required to pay $15 a month, usually, to play the game. It's changed now. There are a lot of free-to-play MMOs with, like, bonus subscriptions for yeah. 15 Final Fantasy is still subscription-based. Final Fantasy yeah. still, so is WoW. And both Fallout of them. 76. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting too tough. I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> Fallout first. Was EverQuest uh, Yes, it was. Yes, based? subscription. Yeah. So it's $15 a month to play WoW specifically and Final Fantasy. And players create a character in the world of Azeroth, which is the world of World of Warcraft. Um, <laughs> and they pick a team, which we kind of briefly touched on, the Alliance or the Horde. Yeah. And this is important because the continents are divided up into safe areas for one team, which are very dangerous for the other team. <laughs> and then you have contested areas where both players have quests to do and they can attack each other. Yeah. It's a cool idea. And you yeah. start you start at a different place. And all that. Each side has a number of races to choose from, all of which are 
are from Warcraft 3. The Alliance have the humans, the night elves, the gnomes, and the dwarves. And a couple others now, after a bunch of expansions. But this is <laughs> classic World of Warcraft. There were four. No cat people? EQ no. You had cat people. Yeah. The Vosh <laughs> Bob that didn't was turn. in yeah. Lucklin, which was after Velius. <laughs> and then I was a human. Horde has orcs, Plenty undead. <laughs> I didn't want to be any of you freaks. Tarin, which are like cow people. And then the <laughs> trolls, who are Jamaican punks, and they're the best. <laughs> <laughs> they have mohawks, and they speak in Jamaican accents. They're my favorite. You know what Austin is. <laughs> Hell yeah. But in addition to choosing a race, players choose a class. And these classes fill certain roles. It says bourgeoisie yes. or proletariat. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the available classes for the game are warrior, druid, rogue, warlock, mage, priest, hunter, shaman, and paladin. Originally, shamans being only playable by the horde and paladins only being playable by the yeah. alliance. They're the healers. No, paladins they, are like... Paladins were kind of... Healer. In, in vanilla, they were... Basically, every class that could heal was forced to heal, essentially. Okay. Nobody I'm, wanted I'm to a play. priest. They were yeah. balanced. So the, yeah. expansions. so the yeah. roles the roles here, for those that don't know, the holy trinity of the MMO, tanks, DPS, and healers. Healers heal people, obviously. <laughs> DPS, damage per second, they just do damage to everything, and tanks sit there and take all the hits and have a bunch of health yeah. so that the weak people doing all the damage don't get killed. And those terms would kind of, like, grow on to be used even well outside the genre. Like, people... I oh, think... I'll, I'd say uh, virtually every kind of game that follows any sort of I guess the team tactics. Any team tactics requires, yeah, yeah, tanks, healers, and damage dealers. But... After building a character, picking a race, picking a class, players start at level one in a certain zone based on their race. In the big open world, I said, known as Azeroth. And then from there, before we get to raids, which are the important thing for today's story, yeah. players have to level. And players have to level by completing quests, fighting monsters, and uh, completing dungeons with other players, which dungeons are like mini-raids. Five people go into an area that if one person went into, they'd be dead. But they go in together, and that's where the roles come into play. Yeah. You have one person taking all the damage, one person healing the person taking all the damage, and then three people doing all the damage. And you can group up randomly. No. No. Not in WoW. Not in okay. uh, Classic. Oh, you have to classic. You have okay. to find a group. There's no yeah. matchmaking. Okay. you got to spam that chat and be like, yo, yeah. I need a tank. <laughs> but Dan's going to take it here and explain kind of the no AI. leveling differences between EQ and WoW and why EQ is so punishing in this area. <laughs> so this is kind of where I wanted to, again, bring up where EverQuest... Yeah. Uh, really... Was it a lot grindier or just... EverQuest was much, much grindier. Okay. And that's kind of what I wanted to address here with my little example because it's pretty interesting. Yeah. So, like I said before, EverQuest really wasn't designed with balance in mind as much as WoW really was. So my example is... In EQ, classes and races had both experience penalties and bonuses based on what you selected. So if you say it played like a halfling warrior, which are like hobbits, halflings got a 5% bonus experience and warriors got a 10%. And these were multiplicative. So huh. the, what would happen is you multiply that and from like a baseline 100% experience needed to level, a halfling's going to level at 85.5%. That's how much experience they need to level than some like baseline human cleric. As a contrast, if you played like an Ixar Shadow Knight, and Ixar were like lizard people, Ixar got a 20% penalty and Shadow Knight's a 40% penalty and that multiplied to taking 168% experience of your baseline to level. So if you, grouped, if you grouped your halfling warrior and your Ixar Shadow Knight, that Shadow Knight would need two times the experience yeah. to level. And this compounded itself because the way experience was distributed, the experience you got from a kill was divided up based on how much your character had accumulated. Right. So to be an equal level Shadow Knight and Halfling, if you want to be both 15, that Shadow Knight's had to accumulate twice as much experience. So he's going to take two-thirds of the experience on the kill compared to the Halfling. Are you going to want to group up with the, someone like that? Yeah. <laughs> if, what? if that's going to happen to you? Yeah. What a and this, weird system. That is weird. And, and this is before yeah. you could, like, patch stuff, like, as yeah. aggressively as... This didn't get fixed until Velius, where some of these penalties were removed. 
but you can see this is the kind of thing that they really did not understand what no. this game balance would do to things. Yeah. And, and when you talked about grindiness, when you asked about that, so reaching max in WoW might take you like two months if you're really slow about it. You can do it in probably a month if you're committed. If you, to leveling to max in Classic EQ probably took like six months to a year. It was oh, a geez. massive investment. I imagine the people that hit that, it, it, that is a status thing. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. But I think it also <laughs> prohibit people to play that kind of class probably. If you knew yeah, you had that, that kind of penalties, exactly you wouldn't play probably that. That's yeah. the problem with it. You game that system. <laughs> Everybody would probably pick, like, at least if I were, I'd be like, all right, give me the guy who levels, levels up, up the best. best. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, to, to, for an example of that, like, I unknowingly picked one of the hardest classes to level in, in WoW Classic because I like priests in Hearthstone. Oh, okay. I was going to say, I was going to ask. Priests what you're are playing. healers, and they are the healing class, which means you don't do a lot of damage. You can, but it's not easy. And so, like, leveling in that takes me a lot longer than, say, like, our friend Josh, who's a mage, who can yeah. do way more damage than me. So he's And just... he has ways to get out. Like, if he gets attacked by too many enemies, he can get out freeze of them in place and then run away, whereas I just, I'm just screwed <laughs> <laughs> if I get attacked by more than one enemy. But I'm still, like, on pace to level relatively quickly with everybody else compared to, like, EverQuest, where it takes, you know, double as long. Yeah. And that was kind of one of the brilliant changes in WoW and making the game more accessible in the fact that every class could level on their own realistically. In EQ, as you probably found, you're fighting elite mobs in WoW, yeah. you kind of realize you might need help doing that. You probably yeah. need a party. Each fight's a challenge. Every mob in EQ was essentially an elite mob. Okay, so they're all impossible to kill. Basically, <laughs> some classes could not realistically solo anything. You had to group to level. So, wow, yeah, okay. You can see exactly what they were trying to <laughs> avoid in WoW's design. Yeah. Yeah. And then you come to the penalty. One of our most important changes here, the penalties of death. Yes. In World of Warcraft versus death in EverQuest. So as as an important part of our topic when you're covering a rampant plague is what happens when you die, <laughs> uh, naturally. And in WoW, punishment is not too bad. You die, you kind of respawn in like a black and light world as a spirit. You've yeah. got to run physically back to your body to respawn, or you can ask the spirit healer uh, to take like a 10 minute penalty for about 75. You take a debuff where your, your stats are reduced by 75% for 10 minutes, and you take some damage to your items that has to be repaired. In EQ, if you died, you would essentially return to, you'd spawn at your home point, essentially the same as if you hearthed in WoW, and all your items would be left on your corpse. So if you <laughs> like wanted, or Minecraft. <laughs> yeah. If you wanted to go exactly, if yeah. you wanted to go get your stuff, you had to potentially venture down like into a dungeon where mobs might see through invisibility, like undead and regular humans had different. Yeah, you needed different visibilities. You had to retrieve your items without having any of them on you. <laughs> oh, and when so you die, when, yeah, when you die twice, you, you, you die. You die, and you can just keep losing your corpse. And every <laughs> death God. is hours worth of lost experience. You died, you Holy lose experience. Sh oh. Holy shit! Which was a big thing. I played. I never played EQ, but I did play Final Fantasy XI, and Final Fantasy XI yeah. took that losing experience thing from <laughs> EverQuest. Yeah, you d I get to like level eleven, and then I fight one hard enemy and die three times and then I'm back down to level nine <laughs> and then I have to grind my way back yeah. up to level somebody, 11. Nobody wants to see the bars go backwards. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. I heard somebody talk about that the other night, I think at your house, and they were like, nah, I just gave up after that. Yeah, yeah. 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 Somebody else yeah, like... <laughs> Yeah, if I if I saw the level if I saw level go the other way, I'd be like, Man. hell no, it sucks. Like I see, I've not played a lot of MMOs, so I don't really have a lot to say. But I definitely played shooters where there are related things where it's like win some, gain points, lose some, lose yeah, points. And yeah. you're like, if you fuck up, you're stuck in this tug of war. Yeah, yeah. When you died in EQ, you had to be a certain level to use your spells. You could die and lose access. Oh to shit! Those spells. Yeah. Oh my you're god, that, level. that sucks you can't use them so anymore. bad. So then you're even worse off trying to get your shit. Yeah. Back. Now. Another important point. This sounds like a great game. <laughs> it, does, it does sound like. Yeah, like I mean, that's there's something to that level. Is that of, why EverQuest Three is coming out this year? <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. I mean, it was all people had, right? It's like, yeah. Yeah. It was like, WoW wasn't out yet. So it's like, well, it's I either play this with my friends or I don't. I don't. So um, let's just say there's a reason EverQuest 2 was designed more with WoW's philosophy in yeah. mind than yeah. originally Q. Now, in most MMOs, but specifically WoW, it takes place in an open world, like I said where uh, you join a certain server and then everybody else who's in that server is just constantly running around. While you're doing quests, you can run into people, you can ask them for help, you can run into people of the other side, an alliance member or a horde. You can kill them. (laughs) Yeah. You can sit there and wait for them to respond and then kill them again if you want. Yeah. Um, Jeez. (laughs) That's so good. (laughs) And each side has capital cities. Mm -hmm. Randy mentioned two of these, Ironforge, and that was the dwarf one, right, Dan? Yes. Ironforge. Orgamar, which is like the capital for the trolls of the orcs. Then you have Thunder Bluff, is the Tarn one. <laughs> That's a stupid name. Undercity <laughs> is the undead one. Uh, Stormwind is You're the human stupid. one. <laughs> I don't know the other ones. Thunder Bluff. Darnassus. Yeah. Darnassus. Sounds like the worst the, 80s band ever. Yeah. Okay. What's the gnome one called? They were with Iron Forge, ah, similar to how trolls are stupid were with anyway. <laughs> um, they irradiated their own city. So. <laughs> the best was former guest uh, Chris Nudaboom told me he's like, I went to make an alliance member and I saw the dwarves and I went, man, these guys must be the jokes of the whole game. And then he scrolled down to gnomes and said, never mind. <laughs> um, but yeah, that is going to become very important later because these capital cities are full of players. You know, you come across a one or two players when you're out in the world questing, but there's a lot of stuff you have to go back to the capital cities to do. You have to go back there to get new spells. You have to go back there to level up your professions or whatever, your yeah. alchemy or your tailoring or whatever. You have to go back there to sell items. You have to go back there to sell items on the auction house or sell items to other players, often to group up for big things like raids. That's so where everybody's hanging out. A lot of people are hanging out in these yeah. in these areas, specifically at specific times where it's like, oh, raiding night are usually Thursdays, so you log on on Thursday at like 8 p.m. and there's literally wall-to-wall people in there. Yeah, that's uh, cool. As opposed to EQ. Yes, <laughs> and EQ had what was essentially a faction system, so you had good and evil factions. It wasn't enforced as much as WoW did with a hard divide between Horde and Alliance, but you had Dark Elves, Trolls, and Ogres that were essentially evil, so you, if you went to good cities, you would just be killed on sight. <laughs> and certain... And then, for example, the Ixar, which came out in the first expansion, were hated by every single other race in the game. If you went to any of those cities, you would just immediately be killed. <laughs> but at least and you can run back easy and get your stuff. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, the worst part about with this was that in WoW, you have, with like reputations, you have in most, a city could have like a single reputation in EQ. You had a mess of different reputations. Like each guild in a city could be on a different reputation. So the paladins could be on one faction, the warriors on a different one. So you could maybe kill some things and get friendly with the guards and you walk into town it's like, oh, I'm good with the guards. And then, <laughs> oh, I walked by the paladins and they slaughtered me because I, I wasn't friendly with them. And so, good luck traversing the city. Yeah. Man, that's like, that's like a social experiment. Like, just, like, yeah, right? like, yeah, you did these capital cities in WoW are safe areas. Yeah. Yeah. No matter what, like... Because right. for I've a minute seen, it sounded like we were I've describing seen, Los Angeles in the I've early 90s or something. I've seen an alliance person try to run into Orgamar before. <laughs> it did not go well. I'll just say that. But if you, are, if you are somewhere. any of the races in the Horde and you walk into Orgamar or Thunderbluff or the Undercity, you are safe. You are 100% safe. Nothing is going to attack you. And if anything tries to attack you, it's another player, and they are going to get destroyed by everyone else in the city. <laughs> well, you're safe unless something like what we're going to talk about today happens. <laughs> well, yeah. That safety, that, when that veil of safety goes away, <laughs> yeah. things happen. Yeah. So we've talked a lot about leveling. The game starts with players at level 1. You slowly quest dungeons. At the level cap for original WoW, it's like... It's double this now, but it was 60. Yeah. Level 60 is the highest you could go. Is anybody, it's 120 is, now? It's 120 now. Is anybody cool. 60 in World Classic? Uh, Chris, Josh, Chad? Yes. Fred, Chris's friend Chad. What are you guys right now? 31. 49. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we'll get to it when you slack it. Yeah. <laughs> when, when a player reaches level 60, they are able to complete something that I've mentioned before, but is going to be very important to our story, something called raids. I've only done those in Destiny. Yeah, because <laughs> Destiny requires six people. Yeah. WoW requires like 40. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
They're like the dungeons I mentioned before, but instead of five people, it's 20 or 40 people. How do you, uh, organize, how do you organize, organize that shit? Yeah. Like, there's like six of us playing Destiny trying not to talk over each other. Yeah. How the fuck They is? require <laughs> insane amounts of coordination, insane amounts of players, and insane amounts of time. Yeah. They are they're a lot longer. They're challenging, and the important part is Destiny does this too, so you'd be familiar with this, like... There are mechanics that in yeah. raids that don't really exist no, anywhere have, that's else what in makes the game. Raids so fucking cool. Yeah, like, that's yeah. why they're like, such a priority. Yeah, every for... other like the dungeons is just like, hey, we gotta kill this guy. So like, kill everything around him, and then we're gonna kill this guy. Raids is like, don't stand in this spot when it's green because then you might get this debuff, which then th- will lead to this debuff, yeah. which then will lead to this. The thing about for those of you that play Destiny that don't know about WoW is that. When you wipe, you got to do the whole thing over again, essentially. <laughs> well, you, you don't have to. How does like, that not lead to people killing other people? Um, <laughs> I get so, so angry. Uh, we're going we're gonna to talk about a specific thing that is very important to our story, instancing. Now, yeah. you mentioned Guild Wars being yes. instanced. Yeah. What that means is you are playing on a server with a bunch of other people. When you go into an instance, you're basically like teleported to another dimension essentially, where, like, you can't really interact with anybody except for the people that are in your party. Yeah. And nothing can come in to get you, and you can't really leave that instance until you're ready to leave or you're done the dungeon. You kind of and have like, to do that. In the regular world, if somebody kills an enemy you need to kill, it respawns, and you got to wait for it to respawn. In an instance, that enemy is there for you to kill. Nobody that, else can come That kill was some it. of my experience playing early WoW, was yeah. waiting for enemies to respawn yes. to complete certain um, quests. <laughs> With a bunch of other people doing the same thing. A lot of these raids, Dan's going to go over it, raids and instancing worked differently in mm-hmm. EverQuest. <laughs> so I promise this will be the last time I make a comparison to EverQuest. I, it's pretty, <laughs> no, it's, it's super interesting. It, it really is interesting to kind of see where the differences fall and see how it influenced WoW's design. Yeah. But as, as you mentioned, and maybe anyone who played WoW Classic uh, on launch might have noticed, you were sitting there waiting for something to respawn with about a <laughs> yeah. hundred other people competing for it. Imagine if EverQuest didn't have instancing. So imagine if that was everything you did, especially raids where you're trying to fight some oh, super man. powerful boss yeah. or you're going to fight into a dungeon and this boss might respawn on a weekly time limit and you have like 200 people sitting there <laughs> waiting for this respawn oh, shit. so they yeah. can all because wow is 40 man yeah. you have a limit you kind of have a structure to how these engagements go everquest is just a brutal melee where 200 people are fighting to get this kill oh, um man. does on... it does it divide up who touches it the same way uh no there's no tagging most damage there's no tagging? most damage takes it oh my so, god so, so wait you're saying that a healer yeah. Yeah. it's a bloodbath you could have shit. like you could be doing a dungeon per se and somebody could just come in and snipe your boss kill out from <laughs> under you that's, if they do more damage i guess the theoretically thing you have to, to realize how much of a massive clusterfuck EQ was. Yeah, like it it is. And, and wow if you aggro something and you don't want to fight it you run like maybe 50 meters away it yeah. resets back to its spawn it just yeah. if it runs back to its starting location where it began. It leaves everything else alone. Yeah. No problem. You're fine. EQ, you had to run to the zone line. You'd have to run out of the barrens if you want something to leave you alone. Yeah. And when you actually <laughs> escaped, mobs didn't just reset yeah. on perfectly. They walked back to their spawn, and they could attack things <laughs> on the way. So if you were deep in a dungeon, you were deep in a dungeon... <laughs> You pulled something. I can't take this fight. I'm going to run to the zone line. <laughs> Everything else in the dungeon groups up in a nice little ball, oh, a train. It comes to the zone line. You escape. Everyone at the zone line ain't so lucky because now those those monsters so that like were deep in the like, dungeon get <laughs> go on a rampage. <laughs> You're just like mining a rock. <laughs> it's like, ah, oh, level one, my first day in this game. It's like... <laughs> Some demon behind you that somebody lured to a town to fucking come through. That's exactly it, because the beginning of the dungeon might be like, oh, look at all those little newbies having a a, a nice fresh time. And then something from deep in the dungeon just gets to the zone line and slaughters everyone along the way. Yeah. A lot of so, fucking chaotic game. Uh, yeah. You can see... It sounds charming in a different know, way. Now, yeah, now I'm into it again. Now yeah. I'm back around. I think now you can awesome. see what WoW was trying to avoid. <laughs> yeah. With yeah, no thing. wonder it was the biggest fucking game ever. <laughs> yeah. Like, these, these dungeons, these raids, too, where there was a lot of structure around them, right? You, like, you join a guild, and then you have, like 
80 people in that guild and then you're just like, okay, it's Thursday. Who's at work? Who's taking care of their kid? Who's available? And then you, you know, you get 40 people and you go do this raid. The crux of like sort of an MMO is that the game does not end when you hit the max level. There's more to do. The yeah. end game. Seems to be the crux of every fucking game. Now. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> How cool but, can you make your character look after you've done everything? Yeah. I don't want it. I just want to play for seven hours and say it was good and go home. <laughs> but, um, but what if you could have, like, a sparkly helmet? <laughs> but, <laughs> but obviously, like I said, running these servers isn't cheap. You need people to continue to be subscribed. And in order to continue, you can only run the same raid so many times, so... Probably takes a lot of work making this Blizzard, too. yeah, they would frequently add new content. Sometimes it would be, like, PvP content, but oftentimes it would be new raids. New raids for, for people to tackle, and then you have that whole classic race to be the first in the server to complete the raid, <laughs> which is... <laughs> it kind of takes on a mind of its own. Anyway, now that we've described it, we're gonna go back and talk about World of Warcraft was released on November 23rd, 2004, which is exactly 10 years after the first Warcraft, to the day. I was playing Half-Life 2, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Having played both, I can say now that WoW is a better game. Oh, I'll, I'll <laughs> leap over this thing. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Yeah, neither one of them's got an ending. But <laughs> <laughs> the reason... The same shit there. Here, this one line in my script is the reason for Dan going over all of those differences. To call World of Warcraft a success is a huge yeah. understatement. Yeah, it's true. Uh, this they got game, a movie. This game lit the world on fire and then some. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's no EverQuest movie. <laughs> yeah. Where there's 200 people trying to go into the same movie because there's no tickets. It's just whoever, show, whoever shows up can watch the movie whenever they want. And if you want to, somebody can just tear down the screen and walk away. <laughs> but Dan's so, going to go over some of uh, the reasons why. Yeah. So I think at its height, EverQuest might have had a couple hundred thousand players sometime in that early vanilla area yeah. wow maxed out at somewhere i think around uh, 10 million or something Damn. close to yeah. close to that i, was just saying, I think it was, it was like that, 12 like, million yeah that's, that's insane that's why i think it's so funny that sticker on the box was like we just hit a million players and it's like <laughs> mm -hmm. that's the beginning and that's <laughs> what i was trying to highlight with all those this comparisons to eq and understanding how much more friendly to the average person it was you, you also had and what we kind of discussed with how there was so many predecessor games, you had a lot of advantages going into this game in that design. And that yeah, there was already had, a world, technically. Exactly. Yeah, you yeah. had a fan base where if someone's going to Stormwind, they know what Stormwind is. They, if they had played the first two games, yeah, yeah. they'd have heard of Stormwind. They'd have context for what they're doing. If someone tells you, oh, go to like Stormwind or go to Ironforge or go to like some town. And they look like they, they should. They, yeah, like, they, yeah. they know where they're going. They have context for what they're doing. It's not – they know the lore and the characters – and so they feel part of this world much more than when you're kind of going into some yeah. fresh yeah. RPG. When you know, they're no. like, and there were like ten years of this. Yeah. So like, yeah, go like, talk to the war chief, and then you go to the war chief, and it's Thrall, and you're like, yeah. oh shit, I know this yeah. guy. Like, you know, I, this is what you were talking cool. about with uh, a friend of ours, Conroy. He was he yeah. was talking about how like he was already into that universe because of these previous games. So yes. it's like. That's super cool. The thing a lot of games don't do now, like Anthem is a prime example of this, where yeah. they like they develop all of this lore, and they're like, people care about lore, so before we make our game, we need to write like volumes and volumes of books, and you don't understand <laughs> that like people don't want to sit there for four hours and read lore before they play your game. It's gonna happen. Gradually. They want to learn the lore yeah. in the game. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I think uh, the other night, make an Anthem one, you, yeah, and exactly. then explain it, and then make yeah. an Anthem two later, and then you can have your lore. <laughs> like, the, yeah, exactly. The comparison you made the other night was the difference between what the MCU did and then what the dc movies did yes where like the mcu like started small it was like all right here's our iron Dan man movie and then you you get to know iron man and then like here's our captain america movie and then eventually when they work up to avengers it feels like a big deal as opposed to dc where they're just like D -d 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 justice league and you're just like who's cyborg what why do i care about any of <laughs> yeah. that yeah i talked, like, talked to dan about this he made it the great point that like 
The first game is called Warcraft Orcs vs. Humans. It is literally the most generic <laughs> fantasy bullshit. Green guy, ever. white guy. <laughs> yeah. And then, like, from there, they added shit like the Night Elves and the Undead, and from there, they developed this world, yeah. and then WoW came out, like the MCU. It takes time. No, every game company wants the phenomenon right out of the gate. Yeah. Like they- <laughs> <laughs> Whereas now they're like the division, the dollar flu. There's this <laughs> faction. You're just like it's in DC. The, yeah. the Constitution is no longer a thing. You're like I just want to shoot people. I just I like I like <laughs> yeah. what you were saying though. Is that it takes a sequel like Division Two comes out and they just throw out the last game and they're like <laughs> and then they just like try again with yeah. this, and something also huge and ambitious and like yeah. grandiose and you're like what. Yeah, the game up. itself is not ambitious, but it just more means like no, I know. Uh, yeah, like every story is the is the most world affecting thing like yeah. immediately, and you're just like I don't know who anyone is. It's, why not do just I... that, it's like why should I care? Yeah, it, I, I see. Like especially with Anthem, there's some like theoretical cool story writing there. Like if you just like I don't know how much of it you guys played at all, but it's just like I played the beta. There's that was potentially enough for me. some cool stuff there, and it's just like. But, well, unfortunately, that game just sucks, so I would yeah. never play it to learn it. But, I don't know, you're right, you gotta gradually build up to that shit. You well, can't just, like, like, yeah, like, expect with, people to be Like, with Warcraft, sold the in your framework world. is there. Yeah. Like, like, it's almost interesting that Bungie did Destiny, which, like, and I'm always, like, campaigning for, like, a new, you know, IP, but, like, imagine if that was a Halo project instead. Yeah, because and they already just had this universe. It probably like, be killer. Established, still. <laughs> yeah, because they, they already have these hugely successful first-person shooters that have their own lore and novels and comics yeah. and everything, and people know those characters and, and those uh, like alliances and those motivations. Bungie and, had clout, and yeah. they also kind of gradually did the lore by you know not having it in the game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, by, yeah, by having to like look up online and read these cards or whatever. Yeah, the grimoire cards, remember those? Oh man, yeah. that's how you get somebody okay. invested in your lore. <laughs> don't have it at first. Yeah. We, but we, if you really want to get yeah. invested, you gotta read it. Yeah, make yeah. some work for it. <laughs> yeah. As we kind of Austin, we talked earlier, following this theme of having these previous games to kind of set up the lore, it actually set up the design of the world in the sense that. The game was designed so that you were basically a character in an RTS. So they oh, could take yeah, buildings, cool. copy and paste them in different parts of the world. And it actually made sense in the context because it's an RTS. So, of course, all the buildings look the same. So yeah. we're not just <laughs> lazy and, and, and reusing assets. <laughs> yeah. It's actually like being an RTS. And as Austin informed me, which I didn't know, it was actually built in the Warcraft 3 engine. Yeah. So it really... Oh, wait, really? It's like, oh, the that's, camera. that's kind of wild. <laughs> yeah. You're essentially playing Warcraft 3 in third person. Wow. Yeah. That's that's See, I think that's way cooler that you're finding your place as a piece of this bigger world as it instead just being centered around you. Like, instead, it's already this established, like, thing. I mean, that's, thing, that's like, the point of raids, isn't it? Where it's like, yeah. you're never going to be powerful enough to take down Ragnaros. Mm-hmm. You need 40 people to do it. Yeah. <laughs> no matter how hard you and, try, and, you're and never going to be that's, powerful uh, enough. Yeah. Like you, you were saying, that's very much an RTS. Where it's like, you need yep. a team of units exactly. that are all like working together in the right way. It, it yeah. really does play into that fantasy aspect of, you've seen the world in all the previous games, so you know the world you're going into. The RTS kind of copy and paste, it really puts you into that world of being in a like RTS yeah. unit and kind of really brings the world to life in that aspect, yeah. as well as making changes that are not uh, as punishing as EQ and, and much more a much more streamlined experience for a casual player. That's mm. definitely like hugely contrasted against the god complex that most video games kind of be Absolutely. like. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. After highlighting all that, it should come as no surprise that critically this game received glowing reviews. Yeah. I couldn't find anything below a 9, a lot of 10s, a lot of people applauding the improved pace over things like EverQuest, (laughs) uh, as well as how unpunishing it was, having a good story that was tied into the former games, the RTSs, and interesting races and classes. It didn't look like somebody copy and pasted stuff out of a Lord of the Rings movie. It's very cartoony and it's very it's got a lot of personality. They've kept that aesthetic. Which yeah, is yeah. how Warcraft 3 looked, right? They just took yeah. the aesthetic of yeah, Warcraft totally. 3, but that's what made Warcraft 3 so popular. So sure. And obviously the game received a lot of awards, editors choices from this magazine and that magazine, Game of the Year yeah, from this game place of the year and that awards, place. Yeah. And this is 2004. I think uh, Academy of Arts and Sciences uh, So this is when Half-Life 2 came out. Yes. And this was also when <laughs> Halo 2 came out. 
Man, what a fucking year. So they beat out two of the best games of all time for Game of the Year from a lot of places, and it makes sense. You think physics are interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> and not only critically, but also commercially, as I said, the game set the world on fire. The game sold millions of copies and had around one and a half million subscribers like at launch. Yeah. I knew people in um, high school that got into WoW who weren't even huge gamers. Like yeah. That's how infectious it was. And the numbers were growing by the millions yearly. And it's hard to tell exactly what the numbers are because Blizzard's really the only one that knew that. But reports say that the game was around 8 million by the time Burning Crusade came out. I remember Burning Crusade being a big deal. Yes. That, was a... that came out three years later in 2007, so they had a lot of time to build up yeah. subscribers. They were at like 8 million by the time. And obviously, this game became the new benchmark for MMOs, and as we all know, yes. being people who looked into the video game industry spawned a billion copycats and, oh, and we, we should do episodes about a bunch of failed MMOs and, <laughs> and none of what well, yeah, we did like one yeah. oh yeah our first well, episode did, is about a wow copycat that, that failed yeah. um, you told nobody, me maybe baseball couldn't it just... could be argued now that wow's been around for long enough that Final Fantasy 14 is digging into it pretty heavily but they, they just released their uh, expansion but recently too and not many people it. yeah or well they, yeah they've had a bunch but I know that they just had a big one not uh, many people were able to dethrone this summer wow. and a lot tried no especially <laughs> culturally like yes. that yeah, yeah the fact that it did get its own feature film and that it was as big as it was in terms of like worldwide box office says that this is something that people absolutely care about now our actual story and the reason we are here begins a little less than a year after the launch of the game on september 13th 2005 yeah this was early blizzard updated the game to add a new raid named and dan correct me if i'm pronouncing this I wrong i can't pronounce that i want to see this zolgarub Garub. Garub. Zol Garub. <laughs> Sounds like a Star Wars character. Um, <laughs> yeah. All the trolls Which, which racially insensitive Star Wars character is that? <laughs> Dan can take the, uh, the explanation of this because I never experienced it. It's not in Classic yet, so... So, I played Classic WoW about at the end of the vanilla life cycle, so most of the raids, it might have been a little before next, but most of the raids that would come out in vanilla were out by that point. Mm -hmm. So this was a little before my time. But Zelgarub was released in patch 1.7, and this was the first 20-man raid, as we kind of oh, talked wow. about earlier. Hurting 40, 40 people, people together was, to get something done is quite an achievement. And up until this point, you had three 40-man raids. You had Molten Core, Anixia, and Blackwing Lair. This That's kind of cool they scaled it back a little bit like to try and help people. More, yeah. This raid was kind of an introductory one in that it was more attainable for the average player. Was it actually who, easier? Like it the, was about at the difficulty of Molten Core, so probably about tier one, like the first one. So it was an introductory okay. one. Was it, it shorter? Was shorter? Mm, we'll go over the, I'll talk about, I'll talk <laughs> Okay, about. all right. Sorry. Shorter. It did some things that were interesting in contrast to the, kind of the other three raids, and okay. then this was an outdoor raid. Every all the other ones where you're you're in deep mountains and molten caverns lava and, caves and caverns. And exactly. Okay. This was an outdoor kind of jungle one where you could actually like mount up and ride around. Oh, and that's cool. It wasn't a right. linear. It was kind of a circle around a central temple point, and you could kind of go to any part of this circle and fight one of the bosses there. So you had a choice of who you actually wanted to do in what order you wanted to do them. And this contrast kind of made it a much more interesting raid than some of the other ones. And the nonlinearity was kind of like a refreshing change of pace. And a lot more people did this yeah. raid because of that. Oh, so they made it appealing, right? <laughs> like <laughs> Before it fucked everyone up. <laughs> Austin's going to go into the yeah. star of the show. Oh, so, our raid. boss. Uh, yeah, the nonlinearity right. of it, there were five priests Probably that were resurrecting priests. their essentially their god or whatever yes. or their leader the trolls all of animal um, god yeah they were all trolls dope i assume our god uh, is the end boss here yes, the end sir. boss okay. by the name of hakar of zolgarub uh you sure this isn't star wars no <laughs> uh they have a star wars mmo it didn't do as well i play galaxies <laughs> well that one too oh wait what was the other one old yeah. republic He's, oh right yeah he was Hakar the That's Soul doing way Flare. Better. Hakar the Soul Flare was his his in-game name. My DJ name. Now, as I mentioned before, raid bosses have special mechanics that sort of set them apart and make the fights harder. It's things you got to learn before you can take them down. And Hakar was no different. Hakar had a lot of mechanics, and one of them caused a bunch of issues. But before we get to that <laughs> one, Dan is going to take over and talk about the other mechanics of the fight. 
So I will set the stage for the fight. As Austin mentioned, you I have, see the first thing on this list. This sounds fine. great. So I need. You have, <laughs> so you have five high priests that yeah. you need to defeat before engaging Hakar. If you don't defeat them, he's got a bunch of crazy abilities that basically makes him an unstoppable juggernaut. When you clear them, though, he comes down to about three primary mechanics. The first one is a mind control. He will mind control random members of your raid. Does that make players actually fight each other? Your, play, your raid <laughs> members will run around killing your raid. That's so great. So you either, either slaughter them or control them with like a crowd control ability like you sheep them or okay. or yeah, something yeah. or fear them so that they don't <laughs> slaughter everyone. That's pretty good. Uh, another aspect was the blood siphon. Periodically, he would stun the entire raid, and he would do kind of a health absorb from the raid and heal himself back up. Mm. So what you needed to do was he had these little NPCs that were called Sons of Hakar, kind of mini versions of himself. Are those your ads? Or? Yes, okay. they were ads you needed to bring up to the fight. You needed to pull them up to his area, kind of at the top of the temple during the fight, kill them, and then they would drop kind of a pool of gas that, okay. if you stood in it, would give a debuff called poisoned blood so everyone in the raid needed to kind of run to at some point to get this debuff on themselves run to the or pool. otherwise they would yes so sign. then when he blood absorbs mm -hmm. he poisons himself huh. yeah and now we'll get to the fun part is <laughs> you have to be careful about doing this grouping up and to run through these pools because he has one more ability <laughs> called corrupted blood this where like he will the pier, std you know, like <laughs> he fires it off at a random person he his std uh, <laughs> and it hits you with a burst of damage and then starts ticking a smaller damage dot over a long period of time. Mm. And if anyone gets near you, if you're not spread out, you pass this to other members of your raid, like an STD. Yeah. Yes. Now. Your swine flu just fucking... Here is where our Avian, story... Wait, is avian flu? Yes. Is that the one? Okay. Sorry, I couldn't remember. <laughs> Here is where our story gets interesting. Now, everybody's got herbs. Now, this debuff, Corrupted Blood... Like Dan said, did a bunch of damage up front, and then it would slowly tick down damage. Now, damage right. is scaled for you to be level 60. It's not supposed to kill you, but it's supposed to be troubling, to say the You're least. You're in the raid, so... Yes. Like, uh, yeah. Um, and the, the buff would spread, but it wouldn't just spread to players. There are classes in the game, warlocks and hunters, who have things called pets. And these pets can do damage for you. Now, the pets could also get the debuff. Oh. And if pets die or if they are dismissed they basically go back into your spell book i guess like into like a weird void where nothing is happening yeah. they get spawned into some can weird every, void i had a pet can every class have pets just hunters and warlocks that's why i chose hunter that makes sense <laughs> um and since the raid was instance this thing was meant to do damage over a long period of time like dan said and if you beat hakar and you left the raid, you were cured of the corrupted blood. Okay. Similarly, there are classes that can cure diseases and remove debuffs. I'm not sure if that one was removable. There's a version later on, which we'll talk about, that was curable. I don't think Hakar's was curable. No, it curable. was curable. It was curable. It was. Yes. Okay. Was because that the only way to cure it? Or leave I the raid. I don't. Okay. I don't remember exactly. It has how a long timer it on it. It does have a timer. It's a long timer. Okay. So the pets are going to be a problem though, because <laughs> a bug was found in this mm -hmm. raid, and the bug was if a hunter or a warlock passed the corrupted blood onto their pet, and then dismissed their pet back to this void, and then they beat the raid, left the instance, and went back into the regular world, and then recalled their pet, the pet would still have oh, the corrupted man. blood debuff. <laughs> they would still have this disease. Yeah. This the caused... parallels between, like, real-world stuff yes. already is... No, this it's caused... Like, it's like rats. Yeah. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. This caused yeah. a huge problem, because <laughs> this thing was coded to exist with only within the raid. And it yeah. was meant to spread to everything. Everything that wasn't Hakar or his well, minions. Well, that's the thing. Yeah. They assume you're level 60 if yeah. you're in the raid. You're 60 so... in a raid, cut off or anything else. So yeah. It's not a problem, right? Yeah. <laughs> but if, let's just say, let's give a hypothetical. Let's say you're a hunter. You dismiss your pet. He still has corrupted blood. You go back to Orgamar. You go to the auction house to sell some item you got. You, bring you your pull your pet back rat, out. Please. 
all of a sudden he spreads it to everybody that's in the auction house, including the NPCs. <laughs> the NPCs who are coded to have so much health they can't possibly be killed, but they can still receive oh the God. debuff. And since the debuff has no visual indicator, like you're not like yeah. turned red or anything, there's no way to tell too. who has it and who doesn't. But, but, it's similar to an STD. <laughs> um, oh my God. I want to know who patient zero was. I, I wish there was some way to like archive that to know. I mean, that's the beauty of, of the instancing compared to things like EQ is yeah. that could it, be anybody. It keeps, it keeps hitting you every yeah. time someone does it. And, and Zelgarub <laughs> reset every three days in kind of contrast to other raids. Yeah. So you're just going to keep getting slammed with this <laughs> as long as this goes on. Imagine having no fucking idea contextually what any of that is. And then just like. <laughs> So, the disease spread like wildfire. Oh, yeah, um, I bet. High-level players are able to withstand the damage. They're meant to withstand the damage. It's right. not something that you can just shrug off, but it is something that you can live through. Low-level like players, on the other hand, <laughs> this thing did about, I want to say, 200 damage a second, oh, or every was, two seconds. That had to be killing them. I think your right. health pool, my health pool as a level 30 priest is like 600. So that thing would kill me in six seconds, and I'm level 30. And no one can cure it either. You can cure it, and we'll get to that. Okay. There's a, I never did the raid, but there's a very distinct reason I know why okay. you can cure it. But I'm sure low-level players have no Low-level no players could not cure it, yeah. no. <laughs> the worst part about it, though, is that the only ways to lose this were to be cured, to leave yeah. the raid, which you couldn't do because you're not in the in, raid. In the raid anyway. Or yeah. to die. <laughs> <laughs> but because... You have to go back to your body to respawn in WoW. Yeah. <laughs> you are surrounded by other people who have the disease, so the second you respawn, oh, you, you instantly yeah, contract the disease again, again and then die again. Oh, that's great. Um, and this draws a lot of parallels to real-world diseases, yeah. with the one exception being that in a real-world disease, if a city contracts a disease... Unfortunately, everybody in that city is going to die, but the disease quarantine. is going to die with them if you quarantine the, the city. Right. That doesn't happen when everybody's constantly respawning. respawning. Man, imagine how bad diseases are if we all had extra lives. In addition to that, you can, <laughs> tele be, you I mean. can teleport. Mages can set up portals to other areas. So they oh, would just so spread it even more. They would teleport themselves <laughs> out of the area and unknowingly spread it to a new area. Uh. Now, there have been scientific papers written about this wow bug. And I'm going to read a description of the plague from one of the scientific papers, which we will get to a little <laughs> bit later, but this is a great description. The pandemic plague that resulted is unique. Unlike previous virtual plagues that had been officially planned, this was a local effect that went out of control, a naturally occurring virtual outbreak. In the worlds of one player, what happened next was just plain weird. When infected adventurers returned to town at the end of their quest, they inadvertently passed along the corrupted blood infection to nearby. In short, the plague ravaged the population. Game administrators were baffled as they scrambled to quarantine areas of the game world. The disease quickly spread beyond their control. Partially to blame was the game's feature that allowed players to teleport from one area to another and which made it possible for the plague to rapidly reach the most distant regions of the map. That's so visual, According too. to information from various internet blogs, several epidemiologic attributes enabled this uncontrolled dissemination of the disease. One was the lack of residual immunity following... Covalescence. This enabled characters to be reinfected and re-enter the transmission cycle. Basically, there's no immune system. So you can, you can re-get the <laughs> right, disease yeah. if you've already had it. The second characteristic was the infectivity to the virtual animals or pets. While pets were relatively resistant to the lethal effects of the disease, they were infective <laughs> to other pets and humans, thus serving as a disease <laughs> reservoir. It's cross-species. <laughs> continuous cycles of the disease between pets and humans could therefore allow the infection to simmer until the group reached densely populated areas. At least it can't mutate, right? <laughs> Third, ill characters could teleport, thus introducing a disease with short infectivity period through large distances. Lastly, once the plague reached the cities, it did not just infect other players, but also non-player characters, providing a large bystander population that would also spread the disease. <laughs> Ooh, what a perfect setup! No, so, like, man. So that kind of you have like some unique factors in that sense of the things that really how it can kind of get past and exist, and you don't just burn out by killing all the people in the city. You just have. A continuous stream of reinfected people. Yeah. You have kind of the pets that are going to just pass things wherever they go, and they can basically, because they can be dismissed, they can carry it for as long as you have that pet. 
So you have the ability to, even when it burns out, to re-begin the cycle. Don't tell me people <laughs> had to euthanize there. <laughs> or even the NPCs couldn't, if you, anybody yeah. who would come to interact with an NPC would get it, right? Yeah. If they had it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to play a clip. Okay. It's only going to be audio, but you're going to hear a sound effect every time somebody takes damage, and you're going to hear a Ugh! every time is, somebody is, dies. Is it like Sonic drowning in the... Se- in- <laughs> Hold on. It's, it's haunting. <laughs> Is it a whole bunch of different people in it? (laughs) (laughs) You sure that isn't a recording from like the Black Plague during like the... (laughs) Alright. <laughs> There's you so get the many point. people that... <laughs> All those sound effects are people taking damage, people dying, and people resurrecting people and healing people. Oh man. And then we have one image which I will show to you guys. This will be a part of the Which thumbnail. is a screenshot, probably, of one of the starting areas of the game. Holy fuck. During the plague. Are those, all fucking... those are all skeletons <laughs> from dead shit. bodies. Yeah, I think so. They they were it. That's oh my god. It's um, a graveyard. It is. <laughs> it is. It is an absolute massacre. <laughs> now, as I said before, me and Dan went over this. Death and well, minor inconvenience. Can repeat a death and well? Makes the game unplayable. <laughs> yeah. If you die the second you respawn, then you're just basically walking as a ghost yeah. back to your death to make one foot of movement every <laughs> every time you respawn. It makes the game take about like oh, oh, like a hundred times the time to play. And I wonder like what our timeline, like how quickly it took to go from the patch to that picture. I want to say it was somewhere within a week, a couple days. You think someone got fired? I don't think so. <laughs> no. You'll, we'll get to it. We'll okay. get to it. I mean, it's weird because it's like, it's a small oversight, but also a really large one. Mm-hmm. Like it, it, The kind of thing is, as a coder, where you make certain assumptions about how yeah. things should work. Yeah. And, and then when, when somebody breaks when it. When things don't yeah, work like... that way, chaos ensues. <laughs> yeah. Man. Now, we're going to get into it. This is where the real interesting part of this comes, because... If you were playing a game and this happened to you, what would you do? Log off? Maybe. Maybe. Right? If I, if I, I was know. playing if I was playing with people, I'd like maybe struggle to find a solution, but I think okay. if I, I think the second like So therein lies the rub. <laughs> yeah, but, um, but I think like the more and more like frustrated, I would just be like, fuck this. Yeah. <laughs> like, um so players started fleeing the cities to avoid death. But in doing so, they brought the plague out of the cities of and into the rest of the world. <laughs> People started setting up quarantine areas to help Ooh. keep safe players safe, but they were breached by players trying to flee the plague. Oh, that's horrible. Or by players who had infected pets and didn't know it that brought them into quarantine areas. Oh, no. Because they How were unaware. You even set up quarantine areas. You just have players killing other players on the edges or I mean, what? basically. Yeah, yeah, like you'd know if an area was safe and then you just wouldn't um, let people in. As I said, there were healers in the game who were equipped with the ability to cure the debuff. Oh, man, they were like um, the true medics. And of many, yeah. and many yeah. healers set up healing stations where players oh wait in God. line to have the disease healed. Just imagine people in line like this. The problem on. was <laughs> the disease spread too fast, which not only caused those healed to immediately contract the disease again, yeah. but it caused the healers themselves to contract the disease and die, and, and then they became carriers yeah, for the disease. Jesus. This um, is a horror movie. Players were passing the diseases, like I said, to NPCs in the town, and the NPCs functioned sort of like asymptomatic carriers, since it was impossible to tell if an NPC had it. There were no visual See, indicators. that's the craziest part. Yeah. yeah, like, I didn't know that. Yes. And, and so, that basically spread it to anybody that was left. Uh, and then on top of that, That's you what makes have... it a true disease. Like, imagine if they just, like, colored your character yeah. in a certain way, and then everyone knew, where it's like, well, those people that are glowing blue, like, we know that they're fucked up, but, like, you, you can't even do that. It's a real disease. Like, that's... <laughs> on top of that, you have so-called, dubbed by scientists, not by me, terrorist players, <laughs> who specifically <laughs> went into areas with the debuff oh when God. they could handle it to spread it to low-level players. But it's something like because they thought hold it was funny. <laughs> um, I mean, it is funny, but that's so fucked up. Not only that, 
<sighs> but in addition to that, you had a system where players would mark themselves as diseased <laughs> to let players not come Scarlet near them. Letter. But that didn't work because some players with the disease just didn't wouldn't know. mark themselves. Yeah. Man. Or, or just wouldn't. Man, um, this reminds me of that alternate in, in the pandemic board game. There's like a, a bioterrorist mode. Pretty much. Oh, um, Jesus. Now, you asked me how long it took to get to this point. I don't actually know. But I do know that it went on for about a month. Until That's a long wow. time for like the biggest game in the world. Yeah. October, month? yeah, October eighth, two thousand five. Nobody um, could go to cities for a month. <laughs> Blizzard performed a hard reset on all affected servers <laughs> and patched the game so that pets could no longer contract corrupted blood, Did that, making like, it impossible for the plague to leave the raid. Man, it did. It had the yeah. the servers went down. They reset the world. Everybody that you know, because the world is that meant to be semi permanent. Consequence in terms of stuff. value. Like, yeah. yeah. Now, as I've said before... At least people kept their pets. Yes. I thought it was going to be like, hey, like we patched out all the... <laughs> yeah. As I we said... We had to uh, euthanize old Yeller. Yeah. <laughs> as I said before, this is not just an interesting story for us to tell on our podcast. This was actually a very interesting story for epidemiologists. People yeah. that study the spread of infectious disease. Because, thanks to modern medicine, epidemics are very rare. Yeah. We don't often have a lot of infectious plagues that spread like this in the real world. What was the last big one? Avian flu. Avian flu? Yeah. yeah. What, in here? No, 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 just uh, in okay. general. Like when you like Ebola. When, Ebola? Ebola? Yeah. So, the thing yeah, is, I don't know. I was trying to get the last they're time I saw rare, the news, like... but that doesn't mean we don't need to be prepared for Of course, yeah. If something comes up, we have to be prepared. I now, said I saw contagion. That was in the... Scientists <laughs> have mathematical models for how they would prepare, how the disease would spread. Mm -hmm. But the one thing that math can account for is the behavior of the human people. beings. Well, that's what Dan was saying as a programmer. It's like you make things a certain way, yeah. and all it takes is for something to not work the way it was intended because of how somebody yeah. reacted. And this is and... really the difficult thing, and not just in kind of plague scenarios, but people who do work on kind of robotics, who are working on like network distributed robotics systems, yeah have similar issues is they need find ways to have each kind of individual in in this distributed system have like a set of rules to follow they, and then kind of simulate by r running each of these individuals with their own rules how are they all going to interact when this system's running simultaneously that's like an impossible amount of tests that you would have to do yeah. and that's really the difficulty in this kind of thing is how if you're trying to model something how do you model a complex system that's going to i don't know yeah that's, that scenario? takes somebody way Except, more knowledgeable and equipped than me to... that's what makes this such a interesting <laughs> case study is yeah. that it provides something like that, that that's yeah. kind of cool though that this is now like so yeah. No matter how a disease spreads, you can make all the mathematical models you want for how the disease would be contracted, how it would go over the airports and people traveling by plane, bringing it to different countries, but you can never account for the behavior of people. That is, Imagine a real that world, is like, possible a renegade that wants to, to mathematically people. model. <laughs> and that's where WoW comes in. Yeah. So. Back when this episode was in its inception, Dan linked me to one scientific paper which is where I got the quote that explained the plague earlier. Right. This is by Ran Balliser, who is the director of the Clayt Research Institute, which is in Israel. And he draws a lot of parallels to the real world and explains how this incident can actually help scientists kind of model more how humans would interact and who'd react in a plague situation. <laughs> That's um, beautiful. <laughs> here is his quote. Okay. Some events in this outbreak are surprisingly similar to recent emergent infections. Now, mm -hmm. this is 2006. This paper was written. Okay. Keep that in mind. The role of an asymptomatic yet infective animal reservoir, for instance, is evident in the avian influenza. Mm -hmm. Asymptomatic ducks had an important role in allowing this otherwise relatively lethal avian disease to become an epidemic in East Asia and spread to other parts of the world. Furthermore, attempts by game administrators to quarantine infected areas proved futile <laughs> due to the ability of characters to rapidly trans teleport to distant lands. This is very similar to the role air travel yeah. played in the rapid global spread of severe acute respiratory syndrome, also known as yeah, SARS. That's why I used that earlier. Yep. Or in the, the modern Planet of the Apes movies. Yeah, well, yes. <laughs> like the real world. Yeah. The study. <laughs> I only know movies, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. The study is obviously not perfect, however, as we've said, the game is ultimately a game. 
it's still useful, but here's a quote, his quote about it being a game. Okay. While the parallels with a real-world outbreak are striking, the artificial nature of the game limits them as models for the real world and might even lead to misleading conclusions about real infectious outbreaks. The mixing patterns and interactions among the game figures may be considerably different for those in the real life and would depend heavily on the rules and goals of the game. The most obvious example would be risk-taking behavior of virtual characters, which depends heavily on the penalties of death or illness and the availability of game saving or logging off. <laughs> he doesn't say logging off, but I'm adding that because right, that's yeah, yeah. basically what he's... You don't save your game in WoW, you idiot scientist. <laughs> uh, despite it's the, like your dad being like, <laughs> just yeah, pause degree, it, dude. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, what's your degree worth, you scientist? <laughs> <laughs> despite these limitations, there could be advantages to studies in virtual worlds. The mixing patterns of behavior observed in the game can be precisely measured and accounted for without the use of epidemiologic problems of incomplete ascertainment or loss to follow-up. Furthermore, the rules and environment could potentially be adjusted to allow better modeling of specific real-life scenarios. Admittedly, this approach depends on the ability to make these changes without undermining the essential pleasures of the game. <laughs> Expert modelers of infectious disease might consider collaborating with game administrators. Such collaborations could harness the immense computational power invested in these economically driven large-scale virtual environments, while allowing simulations more wide-ranging than any options currently available to us. The game administrators eventually cured the plague with a spell that distributed rapidly to players in mass if only real life were so simple <laughs> you're telling me a cure and a spell isn't like the no additionally there are a lot of papers about this that is the only one we have public access to because why would you give public access to academic papers when they want to learn you got to charge <laughs> money for that um, wait really yeah the, what? so there's another paper by Eric Lofgren and Nina Pfefferman. And I want to say thanks to a website called allthatsinteresting.com because they have like clips that. from the paper because I had to pay for it and I don't want to. How much was it? I don't know. It's probably journal access costs. Uh, yeah, you have to pay like a, a subscription. subscription. Yeah. yeah, you get access to like a bunch of different Yeah. <laughs> you think it's uh, more or less than a WoW subscription? It's probably more. <laughs> probably more. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, never mind. <laughs> behavioral responses are simply hard to predict. In their joint paper... This is from allthatsinteresting.com, so okay. this is their words. In their joint paper, Pfefferman and Lofgren discuss how role-playing games display social chaos in a way <laughs> mathematical models cannot. Yes. Throughout the Corrupted Blood incident, players acted in irrational ways that <laughs> epidemiology models would not account for. As a result, Pfefferman has since incorporated these reactions into her simulations and has begun working with Blizzard to model virtual pandemics in other games oh for God. further data collection and research. I like that. That's great. I was just thinking about that while you were talking. I was like, it'd be cool to do that nowadays. Like, all right, we're doing a month-long event, okay? Yeah. Like, introduce a plague into a game that has the consequences. How to that, defeat like, it. <laughs> or, like, something like a zombie-like thing where it's like, okay, if you catch it, you yeah. can't play anymore. Like, yeah. now your character's so, just... Oh, so good. You can log in and watch your character like walk Kojima around. Thing, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, you can log in and just watch your character walk around, but, like, you can't play. That way there's, like, real... Real consequences. Right. That's they didn't good. go that hard, but we will get to that. They did do that. That's Chris, you sound a little congested. You got a little. Yeah, I'm fucked you up. Could you got a little corrupted blood going on. Inside? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> you could definitely simulate. I, mean, I think the theme of what these epidemiologists are really highlighting is that the punishment of death probably wasn't high enough for yeah. it to be a perfect yeah. simulation. You had, ironically, something closer to EQ's level of like experience. <laughs> I, I, oh, it, God. The it, worst it, disease that turned the, <laughs> turned the MMO yeah, Everybody's into level one at the end of it. <laughs> you would definitely have a more realistic simulation sure. if you had more if punishing happened, death. Yeah. If you had more punishing death, really. Yeah. 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 So let's make an MMO where your death is. So, yeah, the, they, <laughs> the game was studied a lot because of this. But... You know, we obviously don't know the effects of those studies because luckily we haven't had too bad of an outbreak in the real world for them to put them to the test. Yeah. But we do have a lasting effect on World of Warcraft and Blizzard as a whole. I mean, uh, and it's not what you'd expect. Randy said yeah. that people would be mad about it, but in reality it wasn't like that. I mean, I was thinking it from the perspective also of just sheer numbers, like how many people were. Like, I wonder if they have any of that data. and It's probably be impossible to actually, like... I can tell you this much. It, but... I can tell you this much. The game had about 
a little over 2 million subscribers at the point that the Hakkar raid came out. Right. And the numbers did not seem to go down after this happened. Okay. They only went up. As we said, it went to 8 million by the time Burning Crusade came out. Maybe players were a little more forgiving back then. Yes. I think anything <laughs> that tells a good story is Yeah, that, yeah that, maybe that, that is so, true. Yeah, so, That's incredibly interesting. Um, <laughs> one might almost say you could make a podcast about something like that. <laughs> yeah. No, that'd be stupid. Yeah. <laughs> um, Who would listen to that? Definitely not me. As, as, what, as happens in video games with big no, scale is, events like this. This is brilliant. Uh, many players were obviously annoyed at the time because they were paying a monthly subscription and it took a month for this bug to go away. Um, That's a long time. But... A lot of players look back on this experience fondly. Yeah, and MMOs are all about social Shared. experiences. Yeah. Shared social experiences. Shared yes. social experiences. And there's and boy, nothing was this one. that brings yeah. people together more than a plague. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> this is like a WoW history book. Like, Essentially. Yeah. Um, and not only that, but there are people who look at this as sort of WoW's first big in-world event, which is oh, weird. which is what a lot of big MMOs do now. Because right? it wasn't planned. But a lot of people... Wait, did this itch. narrative like work itself into that game in the future? And no, mm-hmm. kind of. We'll get to it. Okay, um, that would be cool though. <laughs> in a way, uh, in a way, way in a way. Right. But our old pal Jeff Kaplan <laughs> was a part of the team when this whole thing went down, and he, he lived to tell the took tale. this idea and ran with it later when an event came out in the lead up to Wrath of the Lich King. In which there were, as our friend Chris Nudaboom, former guest, put it, smelly crates. Crates <laughs> that kind of just looked like gross. Like stank lines but you on could them? click on them. Okay. And if you click on them, you would get infected and you would turn into a zombie. Oh. And then from that point on, you would be marked. You would turn into a zombie. Your character model would change and you would be marked for death by both factions. <laughs> But they modeled this so that it wasn't 100% transmission rate. You could bite people and turn them, but they, there was also a small percent That's chance fun. that being around you could turn them into a zombie. So players who became zombies realized, well, if there's a small percent chance that being around us turns us into a zombies, if we group together, that percentage chance okay, is a lot so higher. So this time they intentionally yes. planned the... <laughs> Which then led to a bunch of people hoarding together as giant hordes of zombies and That's running cool, around though. the land trying to yeah. infect everybody. Oh, uh, that's what I would do. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> and obviously, this was part of the lore because the Lich yeah. King's all about reviving the dead. And this was a big event. And it was like the more fun version of Corrupted Blood. There were a lot of people who still were like, eh, I didn't really like that event. I kind of just wanted to play WoW. But a lot of people were like, that was really cool. Yeah, I think it's cool. Um, yeah. <laughs> but we also have another instance. And this one, again, was not planned. In January of 2017, which would have been right after Legion came out, or uh, is tw- Legion 2016? No, Legion was after. The Cataclysm? I'm trying to think if that uh, would that have been Warlords of Draenor. Yeah. I'm okay. To think oh, Cataclysm's old. I'm sorry. Yeah. That's like 20, uh, 10 or 11. So there was another instance, this time called the Sunwell Plateau, which had a boss in it, not the final boss, but a boss, which had a debuff called Burn. And this burn could spread to players. Oh, really? And, oh, but then, and, and I am... surprise, it could spread to pets. And those pets could be put away and leave the instance and then come out and start burning players in the cities. Wow. Except this time, <laughs> this time the game masters were ready as Blizzard had programmed. If this ever happened again, Blizzard had programmed in a thing where you could basically server-wide cure any debuffs. And they beat their time the stuff. instead of a month, I guess. And they released a hot fix one day later. That seems more deliberate. Like, they kind of wanted to show that they could... I mean, the interesting thing yeah, is like, really... I wonder if they ever had to do that. The Sunwell was released as the last raid of the Burning Crusade expansion in... So, so did, did it take, like, someone must years have, to, like... So, someone, I guess... That's interesting that, to wonder if it was there all along or developed, but yeah. someone was going back through an old raid, I suppose, huh. and then discovered that they could I mean, they're do still that. playable. Yeah, they or, are still playable. Players yeah. do do Blizzard that. Blizzard set it up, or could it be that the update changed something? In That's the what code? I was wondering. Yeah. Like if, they, if they went back and then like... Yeah, I'm not sure. But one last effect, which is the one that brought this whole thing to my attention. I like this. It's like cross... Yeah. Uh... <laughs> this was on purpose. Yeah. So Hearthstone released an expansion called the Rastakan Rumble, and these high priests that Dan were talking about were released as cards and one of the cards also that was released was Hakkar the Soul Flayer. <laughs> now for those of you who don't know how Hearthstone works, it's a card game. 
They have a thing called Death Rattle. It's in the same universe as the where Warcraft. Where if a monster mm-hmm. is killed, yeah. an effect will take place once they are killed. And Hakar was such a card where he had a Death Rattle. When he was killed, a, another card would be spawned called Corrupted Blood that would be shuffled into each player's deck. When that card was drawn, it would then deal damage to the player's hero and shuffle two more Corrupted Bloods into that player's deck. Mm. Eventually getting to the point where if you let the game go on long enough, your deck would be nothing but Corrupted (laughs) Blood. And then you would draw the card, deal damage, it would shuffle two more. You would draw another card, it would deal damage, shuffle two more. And then it spread to other people's decks and other games. And then No, (laughs) but hold on. There is another mechanic in Hearthstone, the which are called card backs. Basically, when you're playing against somebody, you can't see their hand. You can only see the backs of the cards. Yeah. And one of the ways that they kind of monetize Hearthstone is they have, like, cool-looking card backs. Every month you get a new card back yeah, if you're yeah, yeah. ranked above a certain amount. And to celebrate Hakar coming into Hearthstone finally, they released a card back called Mark of Hakar. Now, when you're making a deck, Mark of Hakar. you have a default card back. And usually it's just the Hearthstone card back, the default one. But they didn't just give Mark of Hakar to everybody. They gave Mark of Hakar to one person who was a developer, oh. and then he played it. And if you played against somebody that had It's like this, that Borderlands achievement. Yeah. If you played against somebody that had the Mark of Hakar card back, you would then not only get the Mark of Hakar card back, but it would automatically be set to the default and automatically be set to the card back for all your decks. Oh my god. And then if you just let matchmaking go and just kept playing without changing it back, you would then spread Wait, it to other how players. How long did it take for cool. less than twenty four hours? For every single Hearthstone <laughs> <laughs> Not every single, but the Any vast. Play, play, that's played. great. Mo- that is good. Almost 100% of active Hearthstone active players, players got it within 24 hours. So you got it. Right? I got it. Yeah. <laughs> and it is still to this day my default card pack. Yes. I never changed it. That's great. Does it still do the effect? Yes. If a new player joined <laughs> Hearthstone yeah. after so that and funny. you play with them, it still spreads to them and it still sets their default. That's awesome. Um, <laughs> once you have it, though, it doesn't default to you. Because that'd be annoying if you kept playing against other people to keep resetting all no, their cards. No, I'm once, once you did. Once you've had it, it no longer takes that effect. Yeah, that's good, though. But yeah, I remember we started talking about this episode the day that expansion came out because I was like, who's Hakar? And Dan explained the whole story (laughs) to me. And then later he was like, he explained Corrupted Blood. And then we were kind of like, I was kind of like, you want to do an episode of Hot Button? And he was like, yeah, we could do it about the Corrupted Blood. And I was like, all right. Yeah, I I had a long drive with a friend of ours that we referenced already early in this episode with Conroy. And he was like telling me about it. And it's like, it was like fascinating. I was like, I was like, I don't even play WoW. And I'm just like, I'm like totally entranced by this story. It's great. <laughs> uh, definitely the most influential game bug of all time, I'd say. Yeah, probably. <laughs> um, but yeah, World of Warcraft is without question one of the most important games ever made. It has shaped gaming into what it is today. You know, like I said, there's copycats were all over the place in the early 2010s and late 2000s. But Age of Conan. While we don't have copycats, <laughs> yeah, while we don't have copycats like that now, there are still money. games that are still. To this day, every game is a service, and every game wants you to keep playing, and that all comes yeah. from WoW. Yeah. Thanks, WoW. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not only that, but people are so nostalgic for those early days of World of Warcraft that WoW Classic came out recently and has revitalized the 15-year-old MMO. I think I read something that it like tripled or quadrupled their subscriber numbers when Holy WoW Classic shit. came out. I, they, I believe wow. that. They yeah. were back down, I think they were back down to around 2 million, and now it's back up to like 8 or something like <laughs> Damn. that. Damn. Um, that's wild. A bug they got, like this, they got you. They got all of you. Yeah. <laughs> they, got the, they got the blood. A bug like this in any other game might have been written off as annoying. It might have even landed the company in hot water. People yeah. on Reddit looking probably at the would legacy, be complaining. Yeah, looking at the legacy of episodes you know, we've done, this one is a way different... Companies would have to apologize and give currency out to their players or whatever happens now. Daily tweet updates. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we still might... Classic is still on pace to release Zelgrub. I was talking to I was talking the, to to oh, this Chris. Again. <laughs> I, was talking, I, was, hey, yeah. I was talking to Chris last night, our other old guest, about this, and I was like, "Do you think they're going to keep this bug in?" And he's like, "No." And I was like, "I kind of hope they." I kind of hope they do because imagine there are probably people that wouldn't know again. Like yeah. that's the thing. <laughs> but yeah, it, it just goes to show that people cared so much about this world and their WoW characters. That they didn't just log off, they fought this plague yeah, together. Yeah. They That's banded together. Awesome. Some of them turned into terrorists. <laughs> you know? I love um, the medic stations thing. Yeah. That's great. WoW not only shaped the way we look at 
MMOs or even online gaming, but it has shaped the way we look at humanity mm-hmm. and how it behaves in the most unthinkable of scenarios. Yeah. Fucking A. And that is our episode. <laughs> That's brilliant. I almost have a weird, like, FOMO that I wasn't a part of it. <laughs> I know, way. it's weird. Like, yeah, like, <laughs> yeah, it happened before, because I'm pretty sure after our, I was after the AQ20 and 40 when I did Classic, but I did do the Wrath of the Lich King. The zombie thing? Yes, you know what they out. need? Blizz needs to put a memorial in the game or something like that. Like, yeah. <laughs> like just like that. <laughs> yeah. all why those why I'm really curious <laughs> to see if they do anything when they release Zelgarub. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that was good. That was yeah. fun. I was super into that. That was a fun Yeah. Thank you very much for coming here and being yeah. on here with us. Yeah, thanks, for, thanks for helping us tell the story. Yes. It was quite delightful once I was actually kind of getting into it and thinking about what things to talk about it, uh, it's always really... good to get some like direct you know like yeah <laughs> but yeah thank you cool dan for stopping in let's do some plugs and then we'll be out of here yes yeah let's um toss up some plugs so when this comes out next week will be our 50th episode and our one year anniversary oh my god wait it'll be both yeah how do we time that out we missed a week, and then we also had the E3 episode, which wasn't numbered. Was the live one numbered? Yeah. Yeah. Why don't we number the E3 one? Don't worry about it. <laughs> it worked out. Right? It worked out. <laughs> all right, all right. Um, Shut up, right. Right. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, stay tuned for that. Our idea is going to be to go back through our old episodes and make some corrections and give some updates. As yes. These yeah, stories are often them. constantly evolving, and the permanence of the podcast medium doesn't allow us to update episodes, so... <laughs> That'll be our little update cast. Yeah. Um, if this is your first episode listening, thanks for listening. We have 48 other episodes. <laughs> no, I think we have 50 other episodes, uh, including yeah. the commentary and the... Oh, yeah. yeah. The commentary as well. But um, you can go back and listen to those. Those are all available at hotbuttoncast.com, which is our website. That website also has links to iTunes, Spotify, Google Play. A bunch of other shit I've never YouTube, heard of. YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. You can follow us on all the socials to keep you updated on our podcast and get information about new episodes. Yeah, that's all at Hot Button Cast. And yeah, all Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, at Hot Button Cast. I think cool. that's it. Thanks yeah. for listening. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dan. That Thank was fun. you. <laughs> yep. Oh, I think I feel the blood coming on.